So uh, this is very interesting. If we take a look at these two pictures, the first and the second, the only difference between these two plots is that I numbered nodes one, two, three in the first case and one, three, two in the second case. For our data, it shouldn't make any difference. But if we take a look, uh, if, if we take a look at the peers of uh, observations, right, trade operations and bivariate vectors. Vector y, uh, y12 and uh, it would be called y3 in the second setting. They're exactly the same, right? There is no difference. But if you take a look at the uh, edges, at the edges between uh, nodes two and three, you will see that the coordinates, right? They flipped. Now what was uh, y23 now is y3 to, and y, y first. So this uh, potentially can create an issue, right? Because uh, for different orderings, we can have a different uh, sets of data with some coordinates flipping. Uh, welcome to the latest broadcast in the Colorado College of Business's Research Speaker Series. I'm Jim Cochran, the Associate Dean for Research in the University of Alabama's Culver House College of Business. I will serve as the moderator for today's webinar. Today, we're happy to host Dr. Vladimir Melnikov, Professor of Statistics with the University of Alabama's Culver House College of Business. Vladimir earned his PhD in statistics from Iowa State University in 2009, and he joined the Culver House College faculty in 2012. His research has been published in the Journal of the American Statistical Association, Journal of the Royal Statistical Society, Journal of Computational and Graphical Statistics, Computational Statistics and Data Analysis, Journal of Machine Learning Research, and others. He has served as the coordinator for the Culver House College's Applied Statistics PhD program and ISM Associate Department Head. Vladimir was a recipient of a 2020 Culver House Summer Excellence in Research Program for Faculty Grant to support the research he will present to say today. He will present research for uh, 30 to 40 minutes and then he will answer questions from the audience. We'll keep everyone in the audience muted during the talk. If you have questions for Vladimir, please submit them using the Zoom's chat feature, and I will ask you questions at the end of Vladimir's talk. As I share the screen with Vladimir, please join me in welcoming him to the Culver House College of Business virtually to give his talk, Detecting Anomalies in European Trade Data Using Directed Weighted Multilinear Dynamic Networks. Thank you, Vladimir. Thank you, Jim, for, uh, for the introduction. It's uh, wonderful to give a talk uh, uh, for the college. And uh, I can share the screen now, right? Yes, yes, please okay. do. Um, all right, and my talk today is uh, about detecting anomalies in European trade data. And for that, I'm going to use directed weighted multi-layer dynamic networks. Um, this, this research uh, is joined with my former student Shuchi Smita Sarkar and Jana Mjolnikov. Uh, we originally started this project with her initially. And uh, this project started maybe a year ago and it's still going on and probably it's going to be done maybe Hopefully this semester, maybe maybe in summer. This is a very massive project, and we hope to have multiple papers from it. Uh, but I, I will tell you uh, more about this in a second. So first, let me start with the problem motivation. So several years ago, I uh, visited a joint research center uh, in, of the European Commission in Ispra in Italy. And uh, I have some collaborators in the fraud detection department. And uh, during one of our chats, they told me that they're working on the problem of detecting fraud uh, in European trades. And um, they have massive amounts of data. Uh, I, don't, I don't have access to such data. I think that's sensitive data. But the, uh, there is a large number of uh, data sets publicly available on, um, 
on the in the internet. So it was not difficult to find similar data and develop methodology for uh, for, for, for such framework. So uh, let me start with explaining why we have all these uh, words, network, weighted, directed, multi-layer, and dynamic in the title of my talk. So European trade data, uh, uh, it's basically the data on exports and imports among countries. And so we have pairwise uh, relationships this way, right? We, each country exports to another one and imports as well. So we have uh, uh, bivariate data. And uh, these trades uh, can be seen, can be organized in the form of a network. If we think about countries as uh, nodes and uh, amounts of trades between these nodes as edges, then we get a structure that is uh, called network. Uh, theory is quite well developed for unweighted binary networks. But in our situation, we actually have networks that uh, with, with edges having a magnitude. So examples of unweighted networks would be, uh, let's say we have two people representing nodes and whether they are friends or not, uh, the existence of the edge uh, basically reflects whether these people are friends or not. But in our case, uh, we also want to know the amount of trade between the countries. So this is why we have the weighted edges. And as I mentioned before, we have uh, money going out and in, right? So we have export and import, and this is what makes our network directed. So <clears throat> this is another important feature of our network. In addition to that, we are going to talk about uh, networks that are multi-layer in nature. So this is also not a very, not a very traditional set, setup for networks. Uh, we can think about uh, multi-layer networks as uh, multi-varied edges. This is the easiest way to think about multi-layer networks. So if we focus not only on the total amount of trades uh, among countries, but also trades uh, by categories of goods, then we will get to multi-layer networks. And then we have multi-varied trade vector going out and multi-varied uh, trade vector going in. Uh, this is where these uh, multiples, uh, multi-layer settings coming from. Um, this area is actually multi-layer networks. is very has uh, has seen very little development in literature, uh, and uh, one of the most typical approaches for handling such settings is to analyze each layer uh, separately each variable separately and then try to combine uh, the obtained results in order to produce some uh, agglomerative uh, findings. But uh, of course, this is multivariate handling is much more practical and uh, because we can handle uh, covariance, covariances right between uh, the features, etc. So and the last feature I wanted to talk about is the uh, data are going to be lo uh, longitudinal. So uh, the observed data, uh, they are observed over time. So they change over time. If we, in, in the very beginning, while I explain how we develop this uh, setting, how we develop our methodology, uh, I will focus on static networks. So it's just one point of time. And then we will try to extend it to dynamic networks. Uh, my talk today primarily will focus about explaining how, what, what are the challenges and how we handle them with static networks. And dynamic networks, uh, I will just uh, explain it through the uh, natural extension of, of our proposed methodology. All right, so I have explained the title mostly. And uh, now another thing I wanted to mention is the heterogeneity in data. So it's um, very natural to assume that European countries do not have uh, same amounts of uh, trades 
uh, so probably we have subpopulations within the population of European countries. We have subpopulations. It's, it's very likely. So countries that trade not so much with not so well developed economy, and maybe countries such as uh, Germany or France that uh, are with leading eco uh, European economies. So at least we have to have a chance to uh, to incorporate this heterogeneity into our model. Uh, in this setting, uh, very little work has been done. Uh, there is work with weighted networks or directed networks, multi-layer, but most often these uh, are papers uh, targeting only one, at most two of these features of network. In, in our network, by the nature of the problem, we have to take care of all, the, all of them simultaneously, all of them simultaneously. So uh, our objectives, number one objective, and it has been done completely. So to develop methodology and software for static networks. So we focus at one point uh, in a time to model uh, trades among European countries. And first we'll start with the unilayer setting just because it is easier. And then we will extend it to a multi-layer setting. After that, uh, we can extend the proposed methodology to dynamic networks. Uh, at this point, we have developed also the methodology completely and software, everything is working for dynamic networks as well. The only thing that we still need to uh, finish is to basically apply this methodology for detecting change points and anomalies. And the fraud, det uh, fraud detection unit in uh, is price interested, of course, in a variety of different frauds. So uh, in systematic frauds, where uh, that would correspond to a change point uh, when trends, uh, trades, uh, sorry, trades change substantially over time and stay at the same level, perhaps, or maybe in some outline observations. So I would call, I, I call them anomalies. So, some outline observation and unusual trade operation that needs to be detected. All right, so here is the data illustration, how the uh, sample data looks like. This is again a uh, data set I found at uh, World Integrated Trade Solution website. And we can get access to the data uh, at this website. Uh, the data set uh, it has 33, 39 European countries, and I collected the data just for 2000 for the year of 2014. We can see a matrix here, and uh, different European countries are denoted by numbers one, two, three, four, five, and we can see uh, by various vectors. So the first uh, element of the vector represents export, and the second element represents import, and uh, uh, these numbers are actually given in uh, given in thousands. So th these are in thousands. Uh, so this is how our data set is going to look like. We will have a bunch of uh, uh, bivariate vectors y, i, j. Whether the first coordinate represents uh, export from node i to uh, node j, and second. Uh, Coordinate will represent the expert from node J to node I. Um, and first, we will we will talk about the heterogeneity. I mentioned that it's very possible, very likely that uh, we have subgroups within our data set. We have uh, subgroups of countries that trade in different way. What is cluster analysis in general? Cluster analysis uh, has a goal of finding groups of observations such that observations within groups are relatively similar, but uh, groups themselves are relatively distinct. And uh, it's a very big area of uh, statistics and computer science as well. Uh, with many existing algorithms, uh, the most famous are hierarchical clustering, k-means or k-medoids, spectral clustering, density-based and grid-based clustering. But uh, in this work, we are going to rely on what is known as model-based clustering. Model-based clustering uh, is a, a 
probabilistic uh, clustering approach that relies on a finite mixture model, on the notion of a finite mixture model. Uh, in this setting, we assume that each mixture component is responsible for modeling a particular cluster. Let me uh, probably go to the next slide and explain it based on this uh, uh, formula. So in statistics, we deal with incomplete data. And uh, we assume there is a, uh, we basically provide inference based on uh, for population based on, on the sample. But our population might have uh, subpopulations, might have several subpopulations. And then instead of just one sample, we might have subsamples as well. As well. And uh, this uh, idea, this philosophy is reflected in the probability density function that I have uh, written here. So instead of just one uh, probability density function f that models our population data, instead we are going to have k of them. And we take a look at the linear combination of, of, of them. Uh, so this. Uh, this is a very, very flexible approach for modeling heterogeneous data uh, coming from K uh, sub subpopulations. And these subpopulations are typically referred to as uh, mixture components, and uh, uh, subsamples are referred to as clusters. So, this is a very convenient way to think about uh, cluster analysis this way. Um, then each component uh, is responsible for modeling a particular cluster, and uh, this approach is especially particularly uh, attractive if we have one-to-one -one correspondence. There are some complications if this one-to-one -one correspondence is violated. In those cases, for example, when we choose a wrong distribution, we make a wrong distribution assumption for modeling data, but uh, we're not going to talk about this today. The most uh, famous mixture model is the Gaussian mixture model, and this is actually what is going to be useful for us today as well. We're going to assume Gaussian mixture model, uh, Gaussian components. But now let's get back to the uh, to our problem. So in our setting, we are going to deal with a complete graph. Uh, why do we deal with a complete graph? What, what does it mean, complete graph? It means that all edges exist between the nodes. All nodes are connected. Uh, networks, uh, networks are not always like that. Uh, I can give you an example uh, where uh, uh, edges do not exist. For example, think about uh, nodes representing different airports and the edges representing the cost of flying from one airport to another airport. And uh, if there is no connection between airports one and two, then there is no edge, right? And then we do not have a complete graph. But in our case, uh, actually we have all edges because uh, zero trade is still a value. It has, it's, it's still a meaningful uh, result. So if, the, if two countries do not trade, and this is actually not the case in, in Europe because uh, Actually, in, all, in our data set, all countries trade with each other. But even if they wouldn't, zero is, a, is not equivalent to uh, a non-existent edge in, in our situation. Okay, So uh, because we do not consider loops, and the country does not trade with itself, right? Uh, so because of that, we have n times n minus 1 over two pairs of edges. In this picture, I use different colors, yellow and red, just to represent that um, we can have different uh, clusters, different groups of countries. And as you can see, the countries that are given in red color, those nodes two and five, they are connected by pretty uh, bold uh, arrows. And they reflect the magnitude of the edges. And the other countries are connected with much thinner arrows. So that's the idea. Hopefully, we will be able to detect uh, groups of countries that have similar traits in terms of the magnitude. Uh, and this is how we're going to distinguish them. Uh, 
there are some difficulties with this setting. First of all, because we were mostly interested in the inference for, for nodes. We want to identify the countries that uh, that detect fraud, for example, uh, that commit fraud, right? For example, or uh, when we cluster countries, right? We also focus on cluster. We do not uh, group trade operations. We want to focus on nodes, but the data are available for the edges. So this is uh, one difficulty uh, related to this setting. Another very serious concern is that uh, our data uh, are dependent. If you take a look at this table I have created here, these are membership assignments for the edges between uh, the five nodes presented in the previous picture. Uh, and as you can see, all of them are dependent. If I change the membership of, uh, let's say, second uh, node from red to yellow, it will automatically change the membership labels for other uh, peers, including the uh, node number two. So the data are dependent. And one more very interesting concern about this data uh, is that orderings of nodes can lead to different data sets. So uh, this is very interesting. If we take a look at these two pictures, the first and the second, the only difference between these two plots is that I numbered nodes one, two, three in the first case and one, three, two in the second case. For our data, it shouldn't make any difference. But if we take a look, uh, if we take a look at the peers of uh, observations, right, trade operations and binary vectors, vector y, uh, y one, two, and uh, it would be called y three in the second setting. They're exactly the same, right? There is no difference. But if you take a look at the uh, edges, at the edges between uh, nodes two and three, you will see that the coordinates, right? They flipped. Now, what was uh, y two three now is y three and y y first. So this uh, potentially can create an issue, right? Because uh, for different orderings, we can have a different uh, sets of data with some coordinates flipping. And for handling this situation, we are going to use the exchange matrix. The exchange matrix is a matrix that just flips the coordinates in the in the vector. And our model should be, of course, invariant to node orderings. Okay, now I am just going to very briefly outline what we plan to do. Uh, without going into details of this methodology. But we are going to take a look at the space. Uh, I will denote this as this is the space of all possible orderings of node memberships. So, uh, like one, two, three, one, three, two, two, one, three, etc. Okay. And uh, uh, a specific sequence that belongs to this space will be denoted as bold S. For each sequence, there is a, a corresponding edge membership sequence. I will denote it as E with subscript S. This is the sequence of edges that corresponds to a specific sequence of nodes. <clears throat> and we are interested in modeling the joint distribution of uh, joint distribution for our data set. It's going to be done through <clears throat> The following approach. This is actually not completely new approach. I've seen it uh, in another paper recently, and we uh, write down this. We we take a look at the joint distribution of y as uh, uh, as we define it basically by this formula. Here are the first probability probability of e sub uh, of e subscript s. This is the probability of observing a specific uh, sequence of edge membership labels. And the second probability, this is the probability of observing our data set given a specific uh, membership uh, sequence of membership labels. <clears throat> then this is basically joint distribution and then we sum out uh, membership information, right? And then we get the marginal information about our data set, about our data set Y. Uh, 
Next, we make an assumption of a conditional independence of edges. This assumption is much uh, uh, less demanding that, than the assumption of uh, independence of the original member uh, of the original pairs of edges. And uh, because we, we discussed that already, there is a dependent structure, right? Uh, those relationships are not independent. But given membership labels, if we know the membership labels, it is a much less, much less strict assumption uh, to assume the conditional independence, that those uh, edges are conditionally independent given membership labels. Then we get this model. Uh, Okay, one more thing I wanted to mention here is that uh, we assume that we have k components, k clusters, with parameters theta k k. It means that trades in both directions <coughs> uh, are similar. Okay, so we assume that trade in one direction, x part, is similar to the impact. But uh, for modeling uh, operations, between clusters, we should not assume that. If we have a cluster with uh, heavy trades and we have another cluster with just a uh, little amount of uh, export and import, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, the, uh, export, the amount of export and import is going to be similar, right? So one country can export a lot and, the other, and it can import very little, for example. So this is why we'll, we are going to have k times k minus one uh, <clears throat> between cluster uh, components associated with different edges. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, this is just a formula. Uh, we're, we're, we're employing the expectation maximization algorithm and E step and M step outlined here. I will not discuss what the algorithm is and how it works, but <clears throat> All these expressions are available in the analytical form. What is very important and why I'm showing these formulas, uh, and I will talk about this a little bit later, <coughs> excuse me, is uh, if you take a look in this approach, we have a sum over S in the denominator. So we, we have to, in order to calculate this posterior probability, we have to go for all possible uh, <coughs> excuse me, through all possible sequences. And that might be a problem, of course, practical problem. We will talk about this in the future. As I mentioned before, we are going to use the uh, Gaussian, uh, Gaussian components, and they're going to be bivariate Gaussian components. So this is, uh, I will probably skip this. This is how we parameterize <coughs> the model. And uh, all solutions are available in the analytical form. So this is wonderful. Now let's switch to multi-layer networks. What would be different compared to our model we just outlined? Uh, let's take a look at the same data set. In 2014, we have 39 countries, but we have only three, uh, and we have three categories instead of one. Instead of total amount of trade, we are talking about trades <coughs> in capital goods, consumer goods, and intermediate goods. I don't remember definitions of those, but I look, looked up what, what that means. It's just three different categories of <coughs> goods. Uh, and then instead of vectors, we are going to observe matrices. Generally speaking, two by P, where P is the number of <coughs> categories we're focusing on. Uh, instead of now, instead of vectors, we're going to have matrices and uh, very conveniently, we can use uh, matrix distribution, matrix Gaussian distribution. <clears throat> uh, matrix normal distribution is a generalization of uh, multivariate normal distribution. It has three parameters. It has a mean matrix, <clears throat> M, and two covariance uh, matrix parameters. <coughs> One is associated with rows covariance associated with the rows <coughs> of matrices and uh, the other covariance matrix is associated with columns of the matrices. It also has very nice and interesting relationship with multivariate normal distribution through Kronecker product of covariance matrices, <coughs> but I will just keep it. 
And uh, again, the proposal is to use this multi matrix normal distribution, two by P matrix normal distribution to model our trade operations uh, between countries. Um, all <coughs> results are again analytically uh, have uh, closed form solutions. Very nice. And this is actually what makes them quite easy and fast to calculate. <coughs> but there is a very considerable, uh, very serious computational issue. Uh, the issue is, if you remember, I showed you that to calculate the posterior probabilities in the, uh, in the denominator, we have to go through all possible sequences, all possible orderings of uh, membership assignments <coughs> for the nodes. And here is just a little example. If we have just two groups of countries and we have just 10 <coughs> nodes, we have 1,024 uh, sequences to consider. If we have three, and we have uh, three three groups, we have already 59 sequences, 59,000 sequences to consider. Even if we increase the number of groups very very little, like two three, and we increase the number of uh, nodes to 20, we can see that this immediately leads. Uh, to three and a half billion of sequences that we need to consider. So very fast, this problem becomes uh, impractical. We can, so it's not feasible to calculate those posterior probabilities and then the entire methodology would be ruined. So even though in, in Europe, we don't have that many, there is no too many countries, right? But clearly more than 20 in uh, European Union, right? And we potentially can have not three, we can have four or five clusters. So we would not be able to apply uh, this proposed method to in, in the considered framework unless we do something. So, and what we propose is, uh, again, I, I'm just showing you how the Metropolis Castings algorithm was implemented. We can basically approximate uh, those posterior probabilities very nicely and very in a very fast way. Uh, using MCMC schemes. All right, some examples uh, I would like, to, just, just a small illustration uh, simulation study where I would like to show that this approach actually works quite well. We simulated the data. This is how we typically uh, check whether our methodology and the program works correctly. So we simulate the data. <coughs> from a model with pre-specified parameters. And then we try to assess whether we get uh, resu our results close to what we simulated uh, from. So <clears throat> here I considered four different settings. You can see in the, in the very first plot, you can see uh, lots of ellipses. I will ex explain what they mean. So there is a diagonal. And these three ellipses, this one, this one, and this one, they represent they represent uh, clusters, <coughs> three clusters in our model. Uh, these are <coughs> trades, edges uh, within uh, between between nodes that belong to the same cluster. Okay. These two ellipses that are ref reflected over the diagonal. They represent one cluster of uh, corresponding two trades uh, between clusters. So if you remember, we have to take care of the exchange, right, of the coordinates. So the first coordinate can be should be actually should have a way to be treated as the second. Uh, so we have to be able to flip the vector, right? So this is why we have these uh, uh, data points reflected over. Uh, over the diagonal, it means that for some for some uh, trades, for some trades, uh, first we have export and then import, and then it, it's flipped like import and export, right? So this is why we have the reflection across the diagonal. So we have one more cluster here and one more cluster here. So once more, these ellipses on the diagonal they represent uh, trade operations within clusters, within three clusters. And these off-diagonal ellipses, they represent trade operations 
uh, between nodes that belong to different clusters. This is why they are off diagonal. Okay. And here in this little example, I just uh, vary variability in uh, between cluster <coughs> and uh, within cluster variability. So the first case is <coughs> little within and little uh, low between cluster variability. So you can see that those ellipses do not overlap too much. In the second plot over here, <coughs> I keep the same within cluster uh, variability, but between cluster variability, I have changed it considerably. You can see that these off diagonal ellipses increased considerably, right? Same story here, but instead of, uh, I, instead I kept off diagonal ellipses at the same size and I increased the within cluster variability. And here everything is increased. You can see that the data looks like pretty messy. It's not very, uh, not very easy to separate clearly these observations, right, and uh, cluster these data points. But uh, our results are pretty good actually. We considered three different uh, settings with 50, uh, 50 nodes, 100 nodes, and 200 nodes. So you can see that 200 nodes was clearly not possible to run without this MCMZ scheme that we have employed. We have simulated 100 data sets from each, uh, from each model to assess the systematic performance of our procedure. And uh, we use the adjusted rand index. Adjusted rand index um, is the index that computers partitioning. So initially I knew that I simulated the data from three, cluster, from three clusters. So in this, uh, uh, upon uh, uh, after I estimated model parameters, I also get the classification uh, of uh, countries, right, of, of the node uh, of the uh, of the nodes. And uh, if my procedure works very well, I expect that what I simulated from, right, those original assignments, uh, true assignments actually, and my estimated assignments will match. So adjust the trend index equal to one means uh, that the match is perfect. And the clustering, the cluster result, clustering <coughs> solution is exactly the same as the original partitioning I, uh, I assumed when I simulated the data. So the closer to one, the better. The, the farther away from one is worse. So one is the upper bound. As we can see, we do exceptionally well for 200 observ uh, 200 nodes. Right? We have a very good situation here. Only in the case when we have very high variability in data, our uh, average adjusted rand index is 0.988, but this is still so close to one, this is exceptionally good. But moreover, even for 50 nodes, when, when the number of nodes is not very high, we still have very good results, with the worst being uh, 0.813. Actually, it's pretty high for the adjusted rand index. So, we can achieve very good results even for a relatively number, uh, relatively no, low number of nodes. Of course, this happens because, again, as I mentioned before, <coughs> the information is contained not in the nodes; it's in the edges. And can you imagine how many different, how many edges we have for 50 nodes? Right? We have a huge number of information actually. So 50 is not that low either. <coughs> All right, some uh, application to the uh, European tra trades data. We have identified uh, three clusters, actually, so based on the trade operations. And uh, this is unilayer setting. So far, unilayer. In the next uh, picture, I will show you how multilayer setting looks like. And here, you can see that we found three, cluster, uh, three clusters. The red one consists of uh, major countries that basically can be seen as the engine of uh, European Union, Europe's economy, right? So we can see uh, Germany, United Kingdom, we can see France, Italy, Belgium, and Netherlands, six countries in this, uh, in this cluster. And then there is also a cluster of smaller countries. And uh, we have Bosnia and Herzegovina there, Montenegro, <coughs> Albania, <coughs> excuse me, North Macedonia, here is Moldova, uh, actually Luxembourg, Malta, and uh, Iceland also. 
And the hockey cluster basically represents uh, all other countries in Europe. So we can, uh, we have identified that actually heterogeneity uh, does exist in these uh, data. If we apply the same approach, but for the multi-layer state. So we assume three different uh, categories of trades, right? For capital goods, for consumer goods, and intermediate, good, intermediate goods. We can actually detect four clusters here. You can see that uh, this, I don't know, magenta, right, uh, cluster is can, consists of uh, Croatia, right? And uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina and Montenegro. And here we have Albania and uh, Moldova and Malta. So we actually <clears throat> found a different, quite different solution uh, for the multi-layer, uh, for the multi-layer situation, for the multi-layer setting. Um, all right, so now let's talk. We have little time left, so I will uh, talk about dynamic networks now. So for now, we have developed the methodology for static networks. The corresponding paper just got accepted very recently in uh, pattern recognition. Uh, the corresponding R package, NetClust, it has been developed uh, and is available for, on CRAM. It has all the functionality of what I have described so far. It has uh, clustering unilayer uni and multi-layer networks. Uh, and we hope to submit the paper very soon, actually, uh, this semester for sure. Like we are writing the paper that will be describing the software functionality. <clears throat> all right. So what would be different with dynamic networks? I'm not going to talk about the methodology. The methodology is very similar to what I already showed you. But we are going to have one more dimension, right? Uh, so before we had uh, export import, right? That was one dimension. Uh, second dimension was number of categories, of trade categories. And now we also have time. And in order to detect anomalies or uh, changes, change points, we have to basically have time as the third dimension. Naturally, this leads us from matrices, Gaussian metric distributions to tensor uh, Gaussian distributions. Uh, we, we have uh, another paper uh, on handling tensor mixture, tensor mixture models in a much simpler setting, uh, not with networks. It's just uh, in the situation when we assume uh, independent identically distributed observations. Uh, and that paper just got accepted as well. It's in the annals of flight statistics. And uh, it's actually also a very interesting paper. We talk about the analysis of university professor remuneration. So that's the main application of that paper. <clears throat> so let me summarize. Uh, in this work, this is a very massive uh, project. And uh, the first part, uh, basically was the, to develop the uh, methodology, the framework for handling static networks. And this has been completely done. Now we had to, uh, we had to extend it to dynamic networks. And that was the part uh, I was working on uh, in summer. At this point, we have the entire methodology developed, software fully developed and tested, everything is working. And right now I'm running, uh, <coughs> our programs on real data. I hoped I would be able to show you some pictures related to the dynamic data, but they, those programs are still running. So maybe a little later the pictures are going to be available and the results. So after everything has been like at this point, basically we just start needs to apply our developed methodology to the change points and the anomaly detection. And for that, uh, actually, very small twist is going to be uh, needed to our methodology. We just need to uh, model uh, the mean tensor in a different way, more uh, like assume several processes in the mean, in the mean tensor. All right. Thank you so much. I think I, I went a little bit over time.
That's perfectly fine. Uh, thank you very much for that fine talk, Vladimir. Uh, we'll go ahead and take questions that have been submitted by the audience members through the Zoom chat feature. Uh, the first question comes from Martin Liu, and uh, he asked you to go back to the figure on page six and explain a little bit more about what the thicker and thinner lines represent on that figure. So, so thank you. Uh, so, so the network we're dealing with is a weighted network. So it means that magnitudes of connections of these edges can be different. So one country can trade very little with, uh, with another country. And if countries trade a lot, then the line would be basically thicker. So the edge represents the magnitude of the, of the weight associated with the edge. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got another question from John Mittenthal. He uh, says, this is interesting that clusters are not adjacent. Do you have any insights on why this is the case? Uh, so which, which clusters? I think he's probably looking at the map at the end. And if you look at, for example, the blue cluster, uh, Moldova and Iceland are certainly not adjacent. Uh, do you have any, or, or Luxembourg, do you have any insight into how that happened? So, so, so basically we thought that uh, it has very good, uh, we were actually very happy with the results because we thought it has very good uh, geographical meaning, first of all, because uh, those red countries, first of all, we know that they have large economies. And uh, they're all collect, co connected next to each other. What about this uh, gray or blue uh, cluster? Uh, well, those countries uh, close to former Yugoslavia, right? Uh, they're actually also related to each other. So they're smaller countries uh, in the, uh, like, what are they? Bosnia and Herzegovina, Montenegro, right? North Macedonia and uh, I think Albania is not a part of uh, Yugoslavia, of course, but it's close to that area. So uh, in terms of uh, territory, right? I think they're close to each other and this makes good sense. Moldova has a small, relatively small economy, I think, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's, it should be driven by the size of the economy and how, how big trades are going, uh, like, are going, right? Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Anybody want to post a question? We do have a little bit of time left if you'd like to. Okay, I don't see anything else. So uh, we'll go ahead and thank Vladimir. I hope you've enjoyed hearing about the research that Vladimir worked on this summer with the support of a 2020 Culver House Summer Excellence in Research Program for Faculty Grant. Thanks again to Vladimir for his contribution to the Culver House College of Business's Research Speaker Series. And thank you for attending our webinar today. Please be sure to join us for our next webinar in this series, which will feature Pan Jindapan of the Culver House College of Business, giving a talk on his recent Culver House Summer Excellence in Research for Faculty Grant Supported Research on February 5th. Uh, thanks to everybody and have a good afternoon.